time when we put it all together. So I'm going to ask all of our panelists, uh, all of our pre previous speakers to come up. Um, we're going to bring some chairs up here. And I have some questions for people, but looking at the expertise we have in the audience, I think I'm going to flip things around and start with questions that you all have. So let's um, have our speakers come up and get comfortable. We've heard um, during the course of the morning, we've heard firsthand some of the, the challenges, some of the, the, the opportunities, but some of the, the trickiness of getting your life on a good path. We've heard about a program from Pennsylvania that is very robust and has some uh, incredible data coming out of it. And we've also got a sense of some of the things that are going on in Texas. And so now we want to look at specifically forensic peer support. What does that mean for us? Uh, how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be? So with that said, let me open up the floor and see what y'all have to say. Love it. I'm Alyssa. And, and actually, let me add, please project, because uh, we're trying to capture this. It's, it's a technically more complicated for the live stream, but we'll see how it works. In Pennsylvania, are, do you have separate certification tracks for um, people working with uh, mental coaches, peer co peers working with mental illness and with substance use, or one track? There are two different ones. Um, and actually, our drug and alcohol program is completely separately overseen in Pennsylvania. So we do have certified peer specialists and then certified recovery specialist. So they are two different tracks. And the certified recovery specialist is newer to Pennsylvania and it's off to a bit of a slower start. Um, one of our managed care organizations is actually trying to get, because sometimes our drug and alcohol system and mental health communicate less than we even do with criminal justice. Um, it's just because they're funded and overseen very differently. One of our larger managed cares is actually trying to get the success of peer specialists to help kind of be a catalyst for the recovery specialists because they are very slow to start to see any real impact. So they are done separately. Uh, well, first, thank all of you for the, the work. And, you know, knowing Leon, I know that you have done so much in Bear County. So thank you for that and for really setting the stage. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, what's being done to intervene, maybe get some peer support prior to booking, before somebody actually ends up with a record? And then maybe to ask uh, Sheriff, if the Sheriff would please speak. I think in, in Harris County there's a deferred adjudication program for felony uh, uh, offenses for people who have a mental health issue and how that's working so that when people actually get the help they need, when they get out of it, the reentry that we talk about, they don't have that record they now have to contend with. So uh, how peers work in that, how those systems are working, and that's kind of where I was the questions. Well, let me let me give it a give a shot on your on your question. Number one, in terms of <coughs> the uh, the init, the initial intake, what's what's happening at our at our intake system? Regretfully, the Harris County Sheriff's Office is antiquated. I actually went to go look at Bear County system mm -hmm. uh, when I was still a council member and thinking I was going to win my election. <laughs> and so I went to, went to go look at their system and I was very, very envious. Uh, we don't, <clears throat> our process, our facilities are 30 years old, or if not better. But thankfully, we are now consolidating city and county jail operations with a brand new facility in which we are designing uh, the opportunity to do diversion, case management on the front end, okay. not uh, having to stuff them all the way into the, the county jail uh, environment uh, and then try to pull them out of it. And so we're doing that, we're gonna be able to do that here in the very near future. It's under construction, it's on budget, on track, so I'm very excited about, uh, about that. On the other side, the, uh, the, uh, the opportunity I think it goes, it goes to how we're doing with peer support. Is that so peer, using peer support, how it may be working in the deferred adjudication program? Well, in the court, in the court, yeah. mental health court. Uh, the mental health court is working extremely well. Uh, we're having good success there. The, but, I, but I still believe that, um, you know, there's the, the environment in Texas and Harris County is still unfriendly uh, for the large part for anyone who's fallen into a crisis. 
Uh, we still have to, as I say, uh, deprogram the public from calling 911. Uh, we're finally getting Memorial Hermann uh, to stand up critical care centers. Uh, you, we just don't have that capacity, a free world capacity, uh, for families to have easy and uh, well, easy access to get care uh, at its uh, most critical state right. until law enforcement gets involved. And so, uh, I think that's some of the challenges. That's why I continue to kick dishes in the in the shins. Yeah, I got it. I completely get that. I did crisis intervention for nine years and stayed with the police officers in the emergency yeah. room. I I got the the challenges. Yep. So, yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, did you, are you, were you finished? Uh, Madam, uh, ma'am, were, were you done with the question? Oh, I just wanted to know, Leon, I, I know that you've been working towards this, but is this second tier now doing the, the pre-booking intervention? people aren't developing yeah in fact uh, we're, we're going through a strategic planning process right now mm -hmm. and we're looking at our own internal uh, processes uh, where uh, peers would be appropriate and we've got peers uh, on those work groups and uh, so we're trying to work through that and decide how that works uh, it would be helpful if uh, uh, the state of Texas and Medicaid and uh, other funding sources actually pay for that if you really want to drive down the cost of, of health care in a triple A, then peers are a big part of that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I can give you lots of examples, but uh, uh, one example recently uh, is I was visiting one of the peers, and we have a PATH team. So we have professionals that go under bridges and encampments and try to engage people with severe mental illness and get them in treatment who are homeless. And uh, so they do that, and they're very caring and talented uh, people, and, but their no-show rates are very high. Mm -hmm. So they hired a peer, mm -hmm. and the peer actually goes out, and the peer was homeless. You know, they, that peer was on that same shipwreck with the person under the bridge. Right. And they know how they got out, and they can relate much better. And so the no-show rate for the intake went way down once mm -hmm. we got peers involved. And I can kind of go on and on and on. So that's, that's the kind of uh, innovation that you need to use. So if you actually get people in treatment, you know, uh, their, their rehospitalization goes down, their, their rearrest record goes down. If you Google the cost of homeless to the taxpayers, you'll get all kinds of studies that range from about $30,000 a year mm -hmm. to this, the study that was done at the famous research center in San Diego, the Scripps Center, which costs about $200,000 a year because they looked at the county's high utilizers and there were 256 people that cost like $16 million. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the chronically and persistently homeless in Texas died 29 years sooner. They're unfunded, but when they do die, they're dying of congestive heart failure and liver disease because they never get to primary health care. Mm -hmm. They have poor health habits, and that's driving the cost of health care up. Uh, even though we didn't accept the affordable health care dollars, I hope Texas will find a way to do the Texas uh, a model to accept that because I, you know, I think Texas can uh, work with federal government and, and uh, we can accept the dollars on our terms. But uh, you know, even though we didn't take those dollars, some of the, the reporting still uh, 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 applies to, to our community. So if you have hospitals that have high readmission rates uh, that accept Medicaid and Medicare, their reimbursements are going to go down. Yeah, same thing with managed care companies. Well, who are the folks that tend to be rehospitalized over and over and over again? Then it's the folks that we're talking about here. So this, the Texas system is going to have to address this. And uh, like I said, I admire the sheriff for his, you know, his insight about you know, community policing and uh, you know how uh, health and healing, you know, uh, improves the public safety net and, and, uh, and uh, help, helps people get back on the right track. And, uh, you know, I, th I think this is uh, something that uh, there are policy issues galore here. There are funding issues. Uh, you know, how, how you pay and what you count drives behavior. And we don't do a very good job that in Texas. We, a we actually penalize people that uh, serve the more chronically more ill people. Uh, you know, and, and I can give you examples of that. Yes, um, I have a question. Uh, this is, I guess, mainly for the Pure Star, um, but I'll also open, open to the panel. Um, as far as like forensic Pure Specialists, I'm sure a lot of them are, are felons or ex felons are still on paper. Did you find any like resistance from like felons working with other felons? Are there like any kind of opposition from like probation officers or how, how does that work? Because I know certain felons can associate with other felons. And, Sure. Yes, you go ahead, because yeah, you okay. have direct experience sure. with that. Yeah. So initially when we designed our forensic program, we on paper thought that all of our forensically trained peer specialists should have a lived experience of a criminal justice background. Look good on paper. 
Our opposition came more from when we went to put that into practice and were working with the county jails. And some warden said, I will not allow somebody who was previously incarcerated in my jail to work. That's my policy and I won't allow it. And our initial reaction was, we want to fight that, we want to buck the system, but <coughs> there was no give. It, that was the hard and fast rule. So we said, okay, we're going to open our training up to our certified peer specialists who maybe don't have a personal lived experience, but through the training process, they're going to learn from their coworkers and their peers about those lived experiences. So we have trained um, people with a lived experience. We have trained people who've had family members in the lived experience. Um, maybe have worked in the criminal justice system in a different capacity. So we have a variety because we did have opposition from wardens. Some wardens are accepting of that and we have to follow their, their requests or we're not going to have the opportunity to work inside their jail no matter what. So that's a case by case. Um, as far as the felony question, um, we have a, a hiring policy in our agency where we had to make a list of who we can accept as employees and who we can't. Um, we did a lot of um, <coughs> consulting with legal on this of who we can employ. And a lot of that actually came through uh, because we are a Medicaid funded program and um, some of it had to do with liability issues with certain felonies related to forgery and fraud and because we accept medical assistance dollars we couldn't take that risk of hiring somebody who had previously been known to be fraudulent and working in the agency. Um, we had to look at our um, our location of services which are no office based services it's all in the home and community so we also had to take into account the safety of the peers who we were sending our peer specialists out to work with so we did have to limit certain felonies related to um, sexual offenses and violent crimes but we do have kind of a, um, a hierarchy of if this then this and what so there are some felonies we will still employ and then specifically about probation and parole is one of the questions we always ask any peer before they're being assigned. Are you willing or able because of your probation and parole to work with somebody who has a previous criminal justice background yourself because the last thing we want anybody to do is violate their probation or parole. So I hope that answered your question. I'm interested if, there, if the Texas folks have a perspective on that as well. Is that something that, that you've all thought well, about? Well, she's, she's right. I mean, when we first started our uh, been there, uh, done that program, my staff had denied the application unbeknownst to me. Before it even got to my desk, I had to hear it from a third person. And so I had to pull it up, uh, execute the order to make it happen. And, uh, and all the while I was being told, you know, it's going to be bad, embarrassing, uh, there's going to be bad stuff happen, and contraband, and, you know, the, it, the list goes on. But you just have to uh, go with your gut when you know that it's the right approach to do. Uh, same, same here. Uh, we've hired a lot of peers who are felons who work with other uh, folks, and we never ask the question. I guess uh, you know, it's better to ask forgiveness and permission. And uh, those are some of the most powerful peers because they've really been through hell, and they appreciate their recovery, and they cherish life, and uh, you know, they're very motivational when they're, they're working with other people. The, the, the one thing I do want to add is that in my previous life, I was the director of the city's anti-gang office, mm -hmm. and I used uh, uh, social workers, and I worked with ex-offenders and, and uh, providing intervention. Uh, I always felt uh, that there needed to be some degree of success between a person's offense and and uh, their opportunity to do engagement. Uh, you just you want to make sure that they're on the right track, and so I kind of. It wasn't a magic number, but you wanted to look for particular um, uh, milestones that they had accomplished, demonstrating forward trajectory, uh, rather than putting in an environment that would then have them, uh, you know, not do well. And, and yeah. maybe if I'll add to that, one of the things in our hiring policy is there are certain mid-level offenses that we will hire, but we go through an extra um, process of screening them which might be recommendations from their probation or parole officer that they've been successful in their own treatment. So, um, you know, we have certain offenses that we cannot hire for. We have a level of, we'll put them through misdemeanors, things like that. And then we have that mid-level of, 
we need to look at where you're at and being able to successfully enter this employment. So, um, and we actually work a lot with probation and parole officers, maybe former wardens if they've been incarcerated, who make a recommendation that this person would be a good applicant for you. Looking at our friends from Pennsylvania, you have a, a state that has invested significantly in its mental health infrastructure. I think while we're at $39, y'all are at like 280 per capita on mental health spending, which is great. It shows you a progressive state on it. What is the cost associated with providing those CPS and then the uh, uh, CRS workers that, uh, that we've been talking about in this kind of context? Uh, <laughs> I, guess, I mean, I guess the question is, are you looking at, like, what's our reimbursement rate that we... Sure. Okay. Yeah, that can vary and when we're talking well, the, about in the, inside the jail programs. We'll talk about maybe, too, the community and the jail. Inside the jail programs, we are not able to access Medicaid funding. So um, several of our jails are funded through our county-based dollars, um, and that is pretty much the best we can get is at cost. There is no room for anything above that. And that might be at like fifteen dollars an hour, you know, very minimally. When we then are able to transition into the community and have Medicaid reimbursement for that, we have different rates, and it depends on what what county we're in. Well, um, me I Medicaid. Talk, I mean, if you look through that. fee for service, Medicaid um, had set it at forty dollars an hour reimbursement, just to give you what the Medicaid did. You know, it's the state approved. And that's an all inclusive rate, rate. that and, includes. Yeah. That's. That's for your billable hour, but that's all inclusive to include travel, paperwork, training. So there's no separate administration. Yeah, administration. Supervision isn't billable as a supervisor, so your supervision's built into that rate as well. well we'd love to have that right in Texas with the right. same rider, right the same condition. Yeah, <laughs> and, and they, they have uh, the thing you would like too is there, there is a limit in hours per year, so they capped it, but it's. Yeah. It's it's generous and, and you can do up to 17 hours a week with the person. I mean you got to remember like you said who we're dealing with and these are the people that, that need the most uh, assistance and they're getting up to 17 hours a week if needed if they're crawling. And then we shared with Catherine um, when we spoke before one of the, the things is with that generous reimbursement rate we're able to provide an employment opportunity for our peer specialist that is above minimum wage for them. You know in most of our counties we're able to pay you know four to five dollars above minimum wage and that makes this a career opportunity for somebody versus just a, a, an employment opportunity we're talking about people making careers out of this then yeah. I, I'd like to say something uh, about Texas uh, uh, about reimbursement so uh, Texas uh, the MCOs major care organizations and even dishes kind of pay like card services in, for inpatient outpatient services they don't pay for the intensive uh, rehab services uh, per se. You know, uh, and, and a lot of people need residential treatment, they need step downs, they need uh, crisis respite. And uh, so you know, I think in the future, you have to look at the acuity of the person, then have the rate be based on the, the acuity level of the person rather than having this flat fee. Because what happens when you have that flat fee uh, it, it drives you away from what to, to serve these more difficult and challenging people because you'll go bankrupt. Yeah. And these are the very people that you want to serve with public dollars because the return on investment is huge because it keeps them out of jail and prison and emergency rooms and homeless and they're in that vicious revolving door all the time. Plus we already talked about, you know, they die you know, very early and they're million dollar patients. So, uh, you know, we also have to look at you know, policy and payment and, and, and uh, making sure that our funding matches the level of care. And we just, we don't do that in Texas, and so we need to. Uh, yeah, I really just want to ask, because we, uh, you know, we have a, I think probably a room full of people who are very supportive of programs like this. And just to hear from, you know, maybe even all of you, I don't know if we have time for that. You know, where is the opposition going to come from to oppose implementing and scaling up a program like this and what is your advice about how to overcome that very specifically because we're wanting to get real here and make this happen so. you know I, we uh, we just had a bond election mm -hmm. uh, to was it 20 billion or 2 billion for uh, freeway infrastructure and uh, when I was asked you know how I felt about that obviously I like creating jobs mm -hmm. but also early childhood education is uh, contributor to the economy. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and if we can't get people well, it's it, our jail system is going to be unsustainable. And so, um, I think the the opposition is trying to set the right priorities and helping the, leg the legislature think through what should be the priorities and what ultimately is is a uh, return on the investment. As we all say, we get. I don't. I don't think that there's an inherent opposition to this issue. I think it's just the complexity of trying to figure out what comes first with the finite resources. And I think if we can help them understand the math uh, to effective investment in key and critical areas and where the return on the investment is, uh, jobs and economy and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, better care and less uh, re uh, recidivism, I think, it, I, I think we can help them, you know, understand why it's important to invest in this and, 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 and I think, um, I think people are coming to the conclusion that uh, the Affordable Care Act is uh, is going to be here to stay. So let's figure out how to get our, our money back and apply it appropriately. So I think those are the conversations that need to be had. It's not so much, I, I don't believe that there's any uh, lawmaker that opposes this issue, but it's just trying to get in front of all of the other lobbies uh, and, uh, and, and stake our flag on this issue. Yeah, so I, I think it's really kind of t uh, two issues. One is uh, you have people like Jerry Madden, uh, you know, smart justice, Texas justice. That, that's kind of sweeping the nation, you know, because mm -hmm. we, you know, we, we're, we're doing some really creative things here sure. uh, with some great outcomes. And uh, I remember when we passed the, tried to pass $82 million for crisis redesign, mm -hmm. the, the dishes person uh, went in front of Senator Ogden and talked about $82 million for resiliency and disease management. And Ogden says, no, I'm not giving you $82 million for voodoo social work, because that's kind of what he heard. And so uh, we, I ask a very prominent businessman in Texas who was a friend of the center to go tell him, who knew about San Antonio's experience, that really what this $82 million was to improve the public safety net and to save the taxpayers' dollars. And, and so Ogden understood that message, that it, it really was, you know, uh, something that, uh, you know, helps people in recovery, but also is is uh, the smart justice. So I, you know, I think how we message, and uh, you know, we're you know, we got a sunset s uh, session, we got Tom Loose, and this this is going to be our t our our time. Uh, you know, we, uh, we all just have to get together, and that's one reason I'm so excited about the sheriff and uh, other uh, uh, leaders outside our industry uh, uh, kind of speaking up because I think there, this is a time for your voice to be heard. And also build on success that we've already gotten. Harris County has gotten uh, Senate Bill 1185 mm -hmm. built on that success. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, we're I think we're going to be demonstrating uh, effectively how well uh, that uh, that small bit of money uh, will uh, will help us, and uh, take that example to the rest of the, the state and show them uh, you know what that what that additional investment uh, can do you know on a on a broad level. Mm -hmm. For those of you who aren't policy walks, that's the, the diversion funding for the pilot program in Houston. <laughs> I think one of the things we're seeing is an organized uh, resistance. It's just, it's lack of implementation at certain levels, like probation, I think is where we're seeing it the most, wouldn't you say? Uh, Alyssa, is, right. is, is, is it really someone actively, uh, uh, you know, refuting or not wanting mm -hmm. to do it? It's just not being implemented. Sure, and I guess as I hear, you know, and even in a state where we have the state on board and everything's, you know, we're given, but then on a day-to-day -day practical approach, how to get people to actually then implement it mm -hmm. and use it, and I think the biggest obstacle there, and I, I mean, it's still out there is the stigma of it you know when we're talking about using peer specialists um, and then add on we're talking about forensic peer specialists who've been involved in the criminal justice system of getting past that stigma yeah I hear that Pennsylvania is willing to do it and you know um, we get a, a non-oppositional agreement to it you know we've had I'll give just a quick example our most oppositional warden that we started with who was like all right I'll let you try it but we'll see what happens, turned into our biggest supporter because he got past that stigma of it, but he had to see it to believe it. And, and we've had a lot of that. It, nobody said, yes, please come into our jail and help us. We got a lot more of, well, we'll see. It, you know, let's, well, but I'm telling you, we got, the minute something goes wrong, you're out. And don't ever ask to come back in. You know, so I think it's a lot of 
breaking that stigma. And we we are involved with CIT training in Pennsylvania as well, and, and I'm um, proud to be a part of that training team. And something, one, just a simple thing that we're, we're implementing is that I was at a community corrections training, and it talked about breaking that stigma. And here we have certified peer specialists who have to go around, and everyone knows that they've been a current or former recipient of mental health services. If you, you're a forensic peer specialist, everybody knows that you have been involved in the criminal justice system. But for those people who are um, not labeled that way, it's, you know, you know the, the um, activity we do is, you know, everybody think of the worst thing you've ever done in your life. And we all have them, whether or not we, people know about them. But think about the worst thing you've ever done, something you'd never want anybody to know. And that's behind your name after the comma. Mm -hmm. And now everybody knows it, you know, and it's just because we have created a position where it's okay for people to know those things about you, but then that also leads to um, stigmatizing. I think um, on that too, you know, we're asking, uh, we're imposing what our belief system is, how we've evolved it to be on people that that's not necessarily their belief system. So I think a, a lot of it is, is honoring them also where they're at and let us meet us in the middle and allowing this is, takes time and healing on both parts and recognizing that both parts are neither wrong or right, that it is what it is. And then meeting at that place in the middle where um, we, we show them through what's going on and then they show us through their understanding of things. It's, just a, it's completely a, a meeting of the minds in the middle to honor where everybody's at. And in time, it truly does change. I think allowing that time, <clears throat> and a lot of us get really passionate and really angry and want it all really right then, as did I in many instances, but it was through the process of change that it actually changed me. And I think if we allow that, this, this the, um, what do you, the community that doesn't believe or see, it's, and it's not wrong again, it's not that, it's just if we allow them the time and what it truly takes to nurture this, then it will all turn out as it should. And we just don't give up. I don't think anything good comes easy anymore. <laughs> I really think the greatest thing is honoring the um, journey into getting it and, and the path. Then you really appreciate it. Yeah. Yes. I can't think of a more beautiful way to, to wrap up the morning. Thank you, Tuesday. Um, please consider this the beginning of a conversation, not the end. Um, we will be taking the PowerPoints from today, um, links to the videos that will work with a click, um, the, um, a, a link to the report, which, which I hope you've already seen, but if not, definitely go take a look at CPPP's report, um, and the, the clips from the live feed today uh, will be, if you registered online, we will email you notice of where you can find all that information. If you signed up on the paper today, we'll have your email address there. If you didn't do either, give us your email if you want to know where the materials are. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank our partner CPPP for the, the fantastic work they've done over the last year. And a big round of applause for all of our